Hi everyone, it's Dr. A, and in this video, we're going to investigate the initiation of an action potential. But right before we get there, let's take just a few moments to identify the primary components of a nerve cell, which is better known as a neuron. And for note-taking purposes, a neuron is the functional component that outlines how nerve conduction takes place. So first up, labeling from left to right, we have dendrites. And dendrites are specialized structures that receive chemical signals from other neurons. Now, each of these dendrites are attached to what we call the soma or cell body. And within the soma, we find the nucleus. Now, right before we leave the component we've labeled as the cell body or soma, we have a structure known as the axon hillox. And this axon hillox is responsible for merging together a variety of stimuli that are received by the dendrites. From here, we have a long chain that's referred to as an axon. And this axon is either myelinated or unmyelinated. And we'll discuss the difference between the two later on. Now, in between the axon, we have gaps or spaces referred to as nodes of Ranvier. And at the end of a neuron, we have the axon terminal, which signals the end of the neuron, and it's also connected to other dendrites. Now, before we continue further, let's take just a moment to define what an action potential is. And I'd like to do that with you by providing a basic description, and then to follow that with a full description. So starting with the basic description, an action potential is the excitement or the activation of a neuron. But for a more well-rounded description, we need to describe it as a change in the electrical potential along the membrane of a neuron. Now, at first glance, that might not make a lot of sense, so let's delve into that for just a moment. When we see the word electrical here, we really are talking about electrolytes, and electrolytes are chemicals that when dissolved in water or when dissolved within a cell produce ions and ions are chemicals that carry a charge and these charges can either be positive called a cation or negative called an anion for example sodium carries a positive charge potassium also carries a positive charge and chloride carries a negative charge. So in summary, an action potential is a change in the movement and or positioning of these electrolytes along the cellular membrane. So now that we've labeled the components of a neuron and have an understanding of what an action potential is, let's discuss the types of stimuli that activate a nerve and or are a result of an action potential. So the type or category of stimuli that we have are mechanical, thermal, chemical, and last but not least, electrical. Now alone, these categories of stimuli don't really give us that much information. So let's add some descriptors to it. Specifically, when we refer to mechanical stimuli, we're referring to touch. When we refer to thermal stimuli, we're referring to temperature. And when we refer to chemical stimuli, we're referring to smell and taste. And when we refer to electrical stimuli, we're referring to muscle contractions. So in summary, things such as touch, temperature, smell, and taste generate an action potential. And a muscle contraction is generally the result of an action potential. Now, as we think about the generation of an action potential and knowing that it occurs or happens at the cellular membrane, it makes sense for us to explore the cellular membrane a little further. So as we go to explore it, we'll notice that there are two hallmark features, and you may be very well familiar with these. We have heads and we have tails. And the heads are said to be hydrophilic, which means water loving, and the tails are known to be hydrophobic or water fearing. Now, as we examine the tails, we'll notice that we have a tail here 
that's designated as a saturated fatty acid and another designated as an unsaturated fatty acid. Now, in a nutshell, all this means is that this membrane will allow certain components to move into the cell easily, whereas others won't be able to move through the cell without assistance, and others can only move through the cell through the use of a protein channel. Now, for the components that can move through the cell easily, these substances are called or are referred to as being lipid soluble and this includes things such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, and vitamins A, D, E, and K. The components that cannot move through the cellular membrane without assistance are referred to as non-lipid soluble and this includes components such as glucose and sucrose. And last but not least, the components that can only move through the cell using designated channels are specifically ions, and this includes sodium, potassium, and chloride. Now, let's look at a full picture of the cellular membrane. And as we've alluded to earlier, we have two primary components, which are the heads and the tails. And we can see those within the cellular membrane here. And for note-taking purposes, let's identify the outside of the cellular membrane here and the inside of the cellular membrane here. Now, what we'll do next is create a key for the ions that will showcase on both the inside and outside of the cellular membrane. We'll use a green circle to indicate the presence of sodium, and we'll use a pink circle to represent the presence of potassium and we'll utilize a blue circle to represent the presence of chloride. So now that we have our key, let's describe the state of the cellular membrane at rest. First, the outside of the cell has more sodium than compared to the inside of the cell. So let's take a look at the sodium on the outside of the cell. And now let's look at the sodium that's inside of the cell. Now conversely, the inside of the cell has more potassium than the outside of the cell. So let's take a look at the potassium on the inside, and now a look at the potassium on the outside. And next, there is more chloride on the inside of the cell than there is on the outside. So here's our chloride on the outside of the cell and here's our chloride on the inside of the cell. Now, because chloride is negatively charged and we have more negatively charged ions on the inside of the cell, we say that the inside is negative while the outside is more positive in comparison to one another. And lastly, if we were to measure the outside of the cell with a voltmeter, we likely get a value of zero millivolts. Whereas if we were to measure the inside of the cell with a voltmeter, we likely get a reading of negative 70 millivolts. And it's this value in particular that we generally associate with the resting membrane potential of a neuron. Now, there is a mechanism in place that helps to maintain the resting membrane potential and that mechanism is known as the sodium-potassium pump. And the sodium-potassium pump requires energy in the form of ATP. And so ATP attaches to the channel, and this allows for the transfer of sodium from the inside of the cell to the outside. And specifically, we have three sodium ions that participate in this exchange. Now, following the movement of sodium to the outside of the cell, we have two potassium ions from the outside that make their way towards the inside of the cell. Now, in order to generate an action potential, a neuron must receive a stimulus, and that stimulus has to be strong enough to actually elicit the action potential. So, for example, if we start at a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts, 
a stimulus that's less than, say, 75 millivolts won't elicit a response. What generally must take place is that the initial stimulus needs to be higher than the resting value, and we generally refer to this as the threshold stimulus, which is right around negative 55 millivolts. So it's here at about negative 55 millivolts that we begin to see a shift away from the resting membrane potential. And as the value increases, and as we approach a value of zero millivolts, we begin to have what's called depolarization. Now, let's consider what the term depolarization means. It essentially means D-negative. And if we had to define our created term, we would say that it means to denegate something. And if we denegate something, that really means we're making it more positive. And so what's happening in depolarization is that the inside of the cell is becoming more positive. Now, as the inside of the cell becomes more positive and it reaches a value of roughly 30 millivolts, it's reached its peak. And soon we'll begin to see that the inside of the cell repolarizes. And it's through the process of repolarization that we renegate. And all that means is that the inside of the cell begins to become more negative, moving back towards our resting membrane potential. Now, what can happen is that we have a period of hyperpolarization, which means that the inside of our cell becomes too negative. But afterwards, the cell returns to its resting state. Well, thank you for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful. And if it has, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video.